All right. Before we get started, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I assume we have imaging folks and biomed folks in here. So the, this is more for the biomed people, uh, but for your imaging folks, uh, if it's been a while. Um, and this is basically uh, talking about what this is used for. Uh, but first thing I want to talk about is how uh, medical images are produced. All right, we're talking about uh, primarily CT and X-ray. Uh, MRI is a little bit different, but it's the same result. Now, normally how an image is produced. All right, so we have the we have the patient or the the X-ray table. We have the patient on the table, and then above the table we have the X, the, the source of radiation, the X-ray tube typically. And then inside or underneath the table, there's the image capturing device. Now, in the old days, that was film. Now it's uh, the CR plate or a DR plate. All right. Now. They both work basically the, for for our purposes. They both work pr pretty much the same, right? Now think of that imaging plate, that that film or whatever is going to start off as a as a blank image, okay, a clear white image for our purposes. Now, um, radiation that strikes that plate turns the plate dark, right? And the more ra the more radiation that hits the plate, the darker the plate becomes, all right? So we have the patient on the table, and so we're going to fire this radiation through the patient and uh, some of that radiation goes into the patient is going to be absorbed by the patient, and some of that radiation is going to penetrate the patient. Now, we need both, all right? We need both absorption of the patient and penetration of the patient. Now, the reason for that is, uh, like I said, radiation makes the image turn dark, okay? So if all the radiation we fired into the patient passed through the patient and struck that plate, the entire plate would just be black, all right? No image. If the opposite happened, if all the radiation we fired into the patient were absorbed by the patient, then no radiation would strike the plate and the plate would stay just a, a white image, all right? So we need some penetration and we need some absorption. Now, the the odds that a an x-ray photon will pass through a patient, will penetrate through the patient, is determined by the body parts that that x-ray photon comes in contact with. Now, the thicker and the denser the body part, the more likely it is that that x-ray photon will be absorbed by the patient. Now, bones are typically the denser uh, the thicker and denser body parts of the patient. So bones typically absorb radiation, where soft tissue typically allows penetration. So that's why, uh, let's, uh, let's, say, let's say it's a chest x-ray. Everybody's seen a chest x-ray of the spine and the ribs and stuff like that. That's why the ribs and the spine are white images on a black background of your typical radiographic image, because the radiation that went into the patient, the bones absorb the radiation, and those parts of the plate that were uh, shielded by the bone did not get any radiation strike it or not as much so those areas of the plate remained white whereas the soft tissue areas where the pen where the radiation just passed through were more readily to strike the plate and turn those areas darker does everybody follow that okay so that's why your typical x-ray image it's a black background with the, the the whiter images for the bones and things like that okay so um now typically uh blood vessels do not show up on x-rays. And most of the time, that's fine, all right? We're not looking, most of the time when we take an x-ray image, we're not looking for blood vessels, we're looking for bones. But sometimes I do wanna, uh, sometimes they do wanna see the blood vessels, all right? But blood vessels are neither thick nor dense. A blood vessel, uh, an x-ray photon has no trouble passing through a blood vessel. So that's why blood vessels typically don't show up on x-ray images. So if I do wanna see the blood vessel, I have to do what's referred to as an angiographic procedure. Angio means blood, ography means the viewing of. All right, so angiography is the viewing of blood vessels. So what we have to do is we have to put something in that blood vessel during the x-ray procedure that will absorb the radiation that we're about to fire into the patient. That way, those blood vessels do show up on the x-ray image. Everybody follow? Any questions so far? All right, so that's what, is it this button? Nope. There we go. So that's what angiography is. Angio, like, like I mentioned before, angiography is the viewing of blood vessels. Procedure performed to view blood vessels after injecting them with a radiopaque dye. That's the contrast fluid in this syringe right here. It's a special fluid. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, that outlines the images on the x-ray image. Now, this is not the best picture to be the first one because what it is to describe you is referred to as a radiographic image, which is what you typically, you know, when they take the film and they stick it up on the viewer. Uh, this is actually a fluoroscopic image which is the opposite, white background with black uh, images for the, for, the re, for the body parts that we're interested in seeing. Now, generally, there's uh, radiographic techniques for three different modalities, all right? There's uh, X-ray, which is referred to as angio, CT, and MRI, okay? Those are the three different kinds of angiographic procedures. And the, the, 
injectors fall into those three categories. There are angiographic injectors, there are CT injectors, and there are MRI injectors. And they do have specialties. There, is, there are things that make this, this contrast injector uh, specialized in CT procedures. There's things about the angiographic injector that makes them conducive to angiographic procedures, which is typically the patient on the table. Everybody knows what CT is. And then there's the third kind of con contrast injector, which is an MRI injector. The primary thing with an MRI injector is that it has to be all uh, non-metal. No, no, it has to be completely non-ferrous because the, the contrast injector is actually in the room with the patient during the procedure. And if you know anything about MRI, which it's no big deal if you don't, but MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. The key word there is magnetic, an incredibly powerful magnetic field makes the magic happen to produce the images. So the machine, the contrast injector has to be all non-ferrous because the contrast injector is right next to the table with the patient. So those are the three kinds of contrast injectors. Each of the systems uses an injector to inject the contrast medium into the patient to improve, or in some cases, make it at all possible to view the blood vessels, and the images produced are referred to as angiograms or angiographs. Now, uh, for CT and MRI injectors, remember there's three kinds. There's angio, there's CT, and MRI. For CT and MRI, uh, they use an IV needle. The IV needle just typically goes in the arm or maybe the back of the hand or something like that. And a CT and MRI procedure, has anybody ever had a, an MRI procedure? One or two of you. All right, an MRI procedure is a very slow procedure. Everybody's had, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody's had an X-ray procedure. Uh, X-ray procedure is literally like a photograph. Hold your breath, click. It's literally over in milliseconds, right? Whereas a CT procedure, uh, it used to be like five or ten minutes long. Now with, and this we're talking back in the 70s. Now with technology, um, CT procedures are 30 seconds for the most part. But it's, but it's still not over in a second. And then, um, but angio, angiographic procedures. Those are typically very, very short shots, all right? So uh, for CT and MRI procedures, because they're relatively long and slow procedures, uh, they use IV needles and they shoot a relatively low flow rate, meaning the injection into the patient is relatively slow and it takes, it takes place over many, many, many seconds, all right? Whereas angiographic procedures, um, angiographic procedures don't use IV needles ever. They use catheters. And a catheter is inserted typically into the femoral artery or the femoral vein. And a catheter is, you know, like two, three feet long, and it's very thin. And they'll actually snake the tip of that catheter up into a particular body part. And then to the, like, like the heart is a very common one. So they'll snake this the tip of the catheter up into one of the four chambers of the heart. And then during the actual x-ray procedure, that snapshot, they want to fill that, that chamber, that left ventricle or right atrium or whatever, with contrast so during that shot, that part of the heart shows up, all right? So those are snapshots. So angiographic procedures, because I want to, I need to fill this body part very quickly with a lot of, with a lot of contrast, uh, angiographic injectors typically have much higher flow rates, whereas CT and MRI injectors going through an IV needle, 10 milliliters per second flow rates maximum. Angiographic injectors are going through a catheter and they're shooting 40 to 50. They're capable of shooting 40 to 50 milliliters per second. Much, much, much faster injections. All right. Stop. If anybody, if during the presentation, if anybody has a question about anything as I'm going through it, uh, just call it out. Now, um, in the United States, oops, in the United States, there's three primary manufacturers of contrast injectors. And this is kind of true throughout the whole world, although in Europe, there are other there are a couple other companies that don't uh, make that don't um, sell injectors here in the states, or if they do, it's very very rare. Uh, by far, the biggest one. Oh, what happened here? Formatting issue. Um, the biggest manufacturer by far, like 85 percent. Well, that's probably not true anymore. But 80, 75, 80 percent of all contrast injectors are Bayer MedRat injectors. Oh, I keep confusing my. Um, Bayer MedRat injectors, they, they're the biggest manufacturer of contrast injectors by far. They make uh, the, the most common CT injectors, which is the Stellant, the MRI injectors, which is the Spectra Solaris and the MR Experian, and then the most common uh, Angio injectors, which is the Mark 7 and the Provis of the Mark 5 Plus. The second biggest company, and they are way behind, but they are in second place all by themselves, is a company that changes their name biannually, it seems like. Um, Literally, uh, they were Liebel Florsheim, then they became Malincrot, then they became Covidian, then they became Tyco, and now they're actually Gourbet, I think. Yeah, 
G-U-E-R-B-E-T is a French company. Um, so now I, I think they're called, I think they're owned by a company called Gerbet. Um, they are a distant second, but they are in second place all by themselves. They make uh, the Angemat Illuminas and the, um, this thing's sensitive. Uh, uh, OptiVantage is their most common CT injector. Angemat Illumina is their most, uh, 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 OptiVantage is the most, CT, common, most common CT injector. The Angiomat Illumina is the most common Angio injector. And the OptiStar is the most common MRI injector. But the OptiVantage and the Illumina, there are a lot of those out there. The uh, OptiStar really does not keep up at all with the MR experience. There's, I've, I think in, I, I started this company in 2008, so that's 14 years. I can probably count on one hand the number of times somebody has asked me, do you guys do the OptiStar? Literally, it's very, very rare. Now, the third company, that's this one down here, and they are charging up the, 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 the home stretch here. Uh, Braco EZM, uh, they make the Asus CVI and the Empower CT and the Empower MR. Um, what they've actually started doing is they started giving companies the machine. So here, you can have the contrast injector, just sign a contract that says you'll buy your syringes and your fluids from us every year. And so, I just in the last few years started, we started doing training on the ASYST injectors just because for the first 10 years or so, nobody ever asked for them. Now all of a sudden, every month, we started getting requests for these. So we acquiesced and said, oh, we're gonna do training on these now. Um, now the fluids, the contrast fluid that is actually injected into the patients. Uh, the intravenous contrast highlights the blood vessels and enhances the structures of the organs. Because like I mentioned earlier, without contrast fluid in the patient during the actual imaging procedure, these blood vessels aren't going to show up at all, okay? Now, this picture right here, this is an image of the heart. And the heart, you can see the outline of the heart barely in the background here. And then this main artery right here coming out of the heart, that's called the aorta. That's literally the biggest blood vessel in the body. This, you can see how well uh, the aorta shows up here. It's very, very white, very bright, very clear. And you can also see, I mean, compared to the heart, the heart is a bigger, thicker body part than the big blood vessel coming out of it. Remember what I said earlier, the bigger and uh, the, the thicker and the denser the body part, the more likely it is that the radiation will be absorbed by that, by that body part. Well, the bigger, thicker body part in this case, you can barely make it out because it, at this moment during this shot, very little to no contrast in it all. Whereas the thinner, smaller body part shows up very brightly because at this particular instant, this is where all the contrast is. So you can see how well it actually shows up on the actual image. Now, one thing you have to remember, though, with these injections, um, it is a timed process. We can't just, uh, especially for the angiographic procedures, it, not so much with MRI, a little bit with CT injectors, but especially for angiographic images. Remember, angiographic images, was, it's, uh, you know, they tell the patient, hold your breath, snap, and it's over. When we're injecting this contrast into a patient, the patient is alive, all right? So the patient's heart is beating. So every second, you know, we inject the contrast here, it's going to be there for literally one second. Heart beats and it moves. Heart beats again, it moves. So there has to be some timing between the actual imaging system and the injector to get this shot at the particular moment the contrast is in this blood vessel right here. And there are ways they do that, but yeah, it's not like we just fill the patient with contrast and say, all right, shoot it up. We, there is some coordination between the imaging system and the contrast injector. It's nothing difficult, but there is timing involved with it. Um, the X-ray beam passing through the patient in the case of CT and angiographic injectors, uh, or the RF energy release from the patient for MRI injectors or for MRI procedures is weakened. The anatomical structures are then enhanced, and the images of those or of those body parts show up as lighter areas on the image. Now, for remember, there's the three different kinds: angio, CT, and MRI. Angio and CT both use X-ray tubes to produce the radiation. Whereas MRI, um, MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. They don't use radiation to produce MRI images. MRI images are produced from a magnetic field uh, that, is, that the patient is placed in, and then RF pulses that emanate from the patient during the actual procedure. And we don't have time to go into exactly how that happens, but trust me, we, we're gonna fire RF pulses into the patient. And long story short, those RF pulses get echoed back from the patient, and those RF pulses that come back from the patient are collected by um, a device. Shoot, what's, um, anybody know? If I could, it's the thing they put over the patient. There's a thing they put over the patient. What is it? No, it's, um, yeah, yeah, MRI coils. Yes, sorry, those coils 
uh, pick up those pulses and produce the MRI images. Now, the important part there is um, for angio and CT injectors that use radiation, the fluid in this syringe right here that we are going to fire into the patient that makes those body parts show up as uh, brighter areas of image, the secret ingredient in the uh, radiation iodine it, or radiation contrast fluid is iodine. Now, I don't know what it is specifically about iodine that makes it do this, but iodine blocks x-rays. It's actually due to the atomic structure and how many electrons are in the, 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 shell, the uh, orbital shells of the iodine fluid, but iodine block, long story short, iodine stops x-rays. So the fluid in your contrast syringe here is it's not all contrast, but it, or it's not all iodine, but it is an iodine-based fluid. And there's there's not just one recipe. There's some iodine, some contrast fluids have more iodine in it, some have less. It's depending on the body part they want to shoot the patient with that will determine which kind of bottle of contrast fl fluid they'll use. All right. So iodine blocks X-rays. Well, MRI doesn't use X-rays to produce the image. So for MRI injectors, iodine contrast doesn't do a thing. All right. So for, I, for MRI injectors, they have to use a different fluid, and it's called gadolinium. Same exact process. I mean, for, for the operator and for us BMETs and stuff, it doesn't change a single thing about what we do or how we do it. It's just that for uh, CT and angio injectors, it's an iodine-based fluid. For MRI injectors, it's gadolinium. And basically, what gadolinium does is it, it, it weakens those RF pulses that I said come back from the patient. The gadolinium weakens those pulses. Well, weaker pulse means... Uh, uh, less less radiation coming back, lighter image, okay? So that's the long and short of it. So there we go. So the lesson there is CT and, ang CT MR CT and angio injectors have one kind of fluid, contrast fluid. MRI injectors have a different kind of fluid. Again, for our purposes, it doesn't mean a thing, maintenance-wise. That's how you spell gadolinium, in case you were wondering. All right. Now, pressure limiting. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to jump ahead a little bit. Um, this is this is actually the display right here, okay? And this is, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't even bring this up earlier. This is the Stellan. This is this is Medrad's. Uh, this is by far the most common CT injector on the planet. Probably 90 plus percent of all CT injectors in the world are this guy right here. And this one is the Cadillac of contrast injectors. This is a really really nice injector. Very user friendly. Very easy to operate, a lot of automated features that it does as far as filling and injecting and stuff. Um, so, where was I? Oh yeah, for, um, for every contrast injector, when we're, gonna do a, when we're gonna do an injection into a patient, there's three things that the operator has to select on the display here. Now there's more than three things they can select, but all the other things that I'm not gonna mention can be left blank, and I'll talk about them later on. But there's three parameters of every injection the operator has to select. They, has to, they have to select flow rate, the speed of the injection, how fast are we gonna inject this fluid into the patient? They have to select volume, how much fluid are we gonna inject into this patient? And then the third thing they have to select is the pressure limit. Now the pressure limit is even, uh, uh, even the operators sometimes don't fully understand what pressure limit is. Now pressure limit, um, every time we do an injection, there's gonna be pressure built up in this syringe, okay? Because I fill this fluid with a syringe, there's this connector tubing right here that actually connects to the syringe like that. And you can see this is a relatively thin, long, thin tube. And then at the other end of the tube, eventually we're gonna have uh, either an IV needle or a catheter. If this were an angio injector, it would be a catheter. So if it's a CT injector, so it would be an IV needle. IV needle is even thinner than this tube. Everybody knows how thin an IV needle would be. All right, so when we're gonna do an injection, when the fluid is getting shoved out of this one and a half inch wide bore right here into this 10 milliliter wide bore here down to a, 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 a 24 gauge needle that's inside the patient, the fluid shoving all this out of here in these tiny little orifices is gonna build up pressure behind, okay? Now, if I do a very slow injection, say I'm doing just a one milliliter per second injection, the injector, the piston is gonna move very, very, very slowly forward, not a whole lot of pressure builds up. If let's say I do a 10 milliliter per second injection where the injector, the piston is moving much faster. So we're trying to shove the fluid out of these tiny little orifices very quickly. You're gonna have more pressure built up in the syringe. So during an injection, there is a certain amount of pressure that gets it built up inside the syringe during the actual injection, all right? The third parameter that the operator has to select, so they already selected flow rate, volume. Now they have to select pressure limit. Pressure limit is the maximum pressure that they will allow 
and this is the important part, this is the part that gets confused, the maximum pressure that they will allow to build up in the syringe during the actual injection, okay? Now, for CT and MRI injectors, that's 300 PSI, 300 PSI. Your car tire only takes 35 PSI, all right? This syringe, most of the time, can take up to 300 PSI without rupturing, all right? Now, that 300 PSI, that is not in the patient. When we go from 300 PSI here during the injection, let's say it's 300 PSI here, we literally drop down into the single digit pressures in the, in the tube here. And by the time we get out to the patient, either through the IV needle or through the catheter, by the time we have fluid coming out, we're down to nearly zero PSI, all right? So that 300 PSI, it's not a goal, right? It's not the, the injection didn't fail if we didn't get 300 PSI, but we're just saying don't exceed 300 PSI. And again, that pressure is not in the patient. Of course, we cannot put 300 pounds of pressure inside the patient's uh, left ventricle or any body part, okay? So it's, that's, and sometimes operators that didn't get trained properly, they'll actually call up the biomed department, you know, when they'll say my pressure limit's not, um, the, my injector is pressure limiting. During the injection, they actually hit their pressure limit. First thing you always ask is what your pressure limit set to. They'll say something silly like 50 PSI. Every injection is going to be at least 100, 150 PSI. And you're like, well, why did you set it to 50? Well, you know, don't want to put 300 PSI in the, in the patient. That's the conversation. So um, for CT and MRI injectors, because of their slow injection uh, parameters, CT and MRI injectors, maximum pressure in the syringes only go up to 300 PSI. For angio injectors, remember, the most, the, what determines the pressure in the syringe during the injection is the speed of the injection, the flow rate. Remember, angio injectors, they'll go up to 40 or 50 milliliter per second flow rates. Angio injectors, they'll go up to 1,000 or 1,200 PSI in the syringe, okay? So angio injectors, you can see this syringe right here. This is naked all by itself. It's, it's plastic, but it can handle 300 PSI, hopefully, all right? Uh, angio injectors, those syringes, same plastic, that cannot take a thousand pounds of pressure. So angio injectors, actually, there's uh, something called a pressure jacket, and it's a thick, clear plastic sleeve that the syringe actually sits in. And that syringe, that, that pressure jacket, literally holds the syringe together during those high pressure shots. So that's how they can shoot a, a, a an 800 or 900 or 1,000 pound pressure shot uh, on the patient. Same thing, even those angio injectors, 1,000 PSI, 1,200 PSI, when it gets to the patient, it's zero. All right, that's, those high pressures are just in the syringe, okay? So the third parameter, so the operator has to select flow rate, they have to select volume, and the third parameter they have to select is pressure limit, the maximum pressure we will allow in the syringe during the actual injection. And um, they should always, always select a maximum. You're not doing the patient any favors, like, you know, for angio injectors, it'll be like 800 PSI is the maximum pressure. And they're like, God, 800 PSI. This is in the patient's heart, you know? So they'll dial it back and say, let's just go 300 PSI or 400 PSI or something like that. Like, that would be okay. Um, that's an operator that's not understanding the purpose of it. Yep. Uh, for CT and MRI, it's 300 PSI. Pretty much all CT and MRI injectors, just the flat default is 300 PSI. Doesn't matter. For angio injectors, and the, the syringes are actually rated at 400 PSI. So that's, and something I didn't bring up, which I'm, I'm going to here in a little bit, uh, these syringes are one-time use only, like all syringes in the medical industry. One-time use only for the patients. For the BMETs, um, when you become, when you start working on these, uh, the, one of the first things you'll do, first time you go work on a stellant, you ask the department for two stellant syringes. Now those are your, your, your PM syringes. You use those over and over and over again. They should get you through dozens of PMs. But for patients, it's one-time use only. So these hold, I mean, it's incredibly rare that the syringe actually ruptures during an injection. Because again, they're one-time use only and then you use them once, then they throw them away. Um, so for CT and MRI injectors, 300 PSI is the default. For angio injectors, it's a little bit different because uh, for CT and MRI, like I said, it's always an IV needle. IV needles, for the most part, are metal, okay? So that 300 PSI won't affect anything, for, or won't blow, won't, won't rupture a, a, an IV needle. For angio in injectors, Angio injectors, there's all different kinds of catheters, okay? There's longer catheters, shorter catheters, some catheters are wider or thicker. Uh, the, the, the opening, the hole that they come out, the, 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 those are gauges. There's 18 gauge, there's 21, 24 gauge needles and everything in between. Um, for angio injectors, they do have to look at the catheter. 
the catheter comes in packaging and on that packaging uh, there will be information about that particular catheter and one of the bits of information about the catheter is the maximum pressure that catheter can take so for angiographic procedures how they know what pressure limit to select they select what's on the catheter packaging and it'll say 700 800 900 something like that that's what they should select all right pick whatever they should pick whatever the maximum is okay because the syringes can take anything that the injector can put out it's the catheter that we're, we're that will determine the pressure limit all right i think i've skipped ahead a few syringes a few um yeah i, mean, I mentioned this the, that that pressure limit is to keep the syringe from exploding it's not it is it's it is patient safety in a way but it's not you know keeping the pressure away from the patient it's keeping this keeping the syringe from rupturing during the injection that's what the pressure limit we're selecting is for now um things that affect flow the things that affect the pressure limit during the actual injection um uh flow rate flow rate is 99 percent of it how much pressure is going to get built up in the syringe is primarily determined by the speed of the injection the faster the injection the more pressure we're going to build up in the syringe. Now, other things that do have a small effect on it, damn, uh, the viscosity, the thickness of the fluid. Now, contrast fluid, it is clear and it is pretty thin, but it's not as thin as water. There is a slight syrupy texture to contrast. Not, It's not real thick, but it is thicker than water. And some contrast fluids are thicker than other contrast fluids. So that's one of the things that will affect how much pressure gets built up in the syringe. Obviously, the thicker the fluid, um, or the thicker the contrast, the more pressure it takes to shove it through those tiny little needles. Uh, and then lastly, the length and the diameter of the tubing. The longer the tubing, the more pressure you'll get a little bit. And then the thinner the tubing or the thinner the IV needle or the catheter, the more pressure you'll get. But again, primarily, it's the speed of the injection that determines how much pressure is built up in the syringe. All right. Now, one last thing on this. I'm going on time. Feels like I'm flying, but whew. Um, now, one thing about pressure limiting that you need to understand. You would think that, you know, let's say we're doing a shot and we hit the pressure limit, all right? We, we've selected 300 PSI during the shot. For whatever reason, my machine says, hey, we're at 300 PSI. The injector does not shut down. It does not stop the injection, all right? And that's important, okay? Because, and the reason for that is, like infusion pumps. Everybody here, I assume, is a BMET and has worked on, on infusion pumps as a good example. Um, Anybody know what's the what's the occlusion rate? The occlusion means we're gonna we we're, we're blocked and we're gonna stop this injection here. Twelve to fifteen psi. If you're if you're infusion pump, it's fifteen psi. Machine stops, shuts it down. Alarms start going off at the nurses station. They come rushing in. Hopefully, um, that's fifteen psi. So this is at three hundred psi. All right, and it does not stop. Now the reason for that is is we're in the imaging department and the patient's on the imaging table and we're shooting him with this fluid at this particular moment. Now, if the injector stops, that means everything we've done, we have to do it again. That means all the radiation we fired into the patient was for nothing. We have to shoot this again. So what the machine does is it doesn't stop the injection. So what it does is to keep the pressure from building up higher and higher and higher in the syringe, it'll just back off the flow rate. It'll slow down the injection. Now, the reason it does that is we might still be good, all right? Even with a slower injection, we might still have a good image. And if we do, perfect. And we might not, we might have to shoot this again. But if the injector shuts down, we definitely have to shoot this again. So the important point there is uh, if your machine does pressure limit during the actual injection, it doesn't shut down the injection, it just slows the injection rate down. Now, if there is an occlusion and the system can tell the difference between an a, a pressure limit situation and an occlusion. Occlusion is a blockage somehow. Something's happened uh, with the, 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 the hose is kinked or, or the, the, the needle is clogged or something like that. In the case of an occlusion, yes, the injector does stop and it can tell the difference between, like I said, a pressure limit situation and an actual occlusion. Any questions? I think that's everything for pressure limiting. Any questions on anything I've covered so far? All right. Um, the contrast injector system consists of the injector head, the display, and then some power supply. In this case, the power supply is down here. Now, like I mentioned earlier, um, and I might be skipping ahead here, this is my display right here. This is, like I said, this is the latest, well, it's not the latest. This is the latest display from, uh, uh, from uh, Bayer MedRad. And you can see up here, 
um, I have a contrast syringe and I have a saline syringe. Now contrast, you'll notice that it's coated color green. The saline is colored blue. That's not a universal color system, but a lot of manufacturers use these two colors, especially the blue. Blue for saline. Saline is basically salt water, blue water. So whenever you see a blue syringe, that typically means saline. And then the other color, in most, most of the cases it's green, but sometimes it's a little bit different. That's the contrast syringe, okay? And you'll notice on my display here, it shows us syringe A is green and syringe B is um, saline. And if I move, let me get rid of this. If I move my syringes, you'll notice it changes on the display as it goes. All right, same thing with the saline syringe. It'll actually show the fluid, a, a graphic description of how much fluid is in the syringe during the actual injection. Now these numbers over here, remember there's three things the operator has to select, flow rate, volume, and pressure limit. This column right here, or I'm sorry, let me start with the row. This first row right here, it says A and it's green. That means this is, um, uh, you see there's two rows here, That this is a two phase injection, all right? So the first phase right here, the first row, this first column right here is flow rate. So I'm gonna shoot green, that means saline, flow rate of three milliliters per second. And I'm gonna shoot a volume of six milliliters. Let's change this. All right, and then phase two down here, it's blue, so that means saline. And we're gonna shoot a flow rate of five and a volume of 20 milliliters. Now you can go up to uh, four, six, some, some models even go up to eight phases, all right? Uh, and I'll talk more about that here in a second, but I just wanted to show the display here. Um, and then over here on this particular display, it shows right here, here's how, where you select your pressure limit. You select anywhere from 50 to 325 on this particular model. Typically we'll select 300 PSI, so then it'll show you here what the selected pressure limit is. So those are the three things the operator has to select. And I'll get to some of the other things later on. So how we would actually do this, so I've selected this injection parameter right here. Um, now on this particular model, not all not all injector models do this, but uh, there's a lock button right here. You press the lock button, that basically locks the display out. Now from this point on, um, the operator cannot change the parameters of the shot without ending the shot, all right? Um, now this button right here, the arm switch, I'm gonna, again, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but the arm button, um, before this yellow button right here, which is the, the inject button, before that button can be hit, and this is true of all injectors, the injector has to be armed, all right? Armed means we are intentionally preparing this injection, this injector to shoot this shot. So I'm gonna hit arm, and then the liability question pops up. It's saying, have you checked for error, all right? And the operator has to select, yes, I have checked for error. So even though obviously there's nothing but error in here, it is on the operator's due diligence to check for error, make sure there's no air bubbles in the syringe, and they have to answer yes to this question. Every injector, every injector on the planet, I think, um, ask this question before we actually hit the patient with this. Um, do you wish to confirm that you have checked for air, yes or no? And I will hit yes. And my injector is now armed. And you heard the beep, and every injector, there will be some auditory signal that the injector is armed and some visual indicator that the injector is armed. And on this particular one, it's the green and blue uh, LEDs lighting up, telling the operator, you hit that button now. It's a go. So then we hit inject and first phase, contrast, second phase, saline, and then the injection's over, all right? Like I said, that was a two phase injection. You can shoot a three or four. Some models go up to six or eight phases during the injection. You just hit the start switch one time and it will go through all the different phases. To the injector, this is two injections. Or I'm sorry, to the, to the to the injector, this is two injections, but to us, it's one injection. We hit the inject switch once, and it will go through all the phases back to back to back to back. All right, more on that in just a few minutes. Any questions? Okay. Yep. No, what they'll do is typically what I just did was you saw me enter manually enter the flow rate, manually enter the volume. They don't typically do that. There's param the parameters, the protocols, the parameters, the protocols, the flow rates and the volumes, they can be saved in memory. Because to be honest, they, they, they pretty much never will sit there and have the patient on the table and say, all right, a flow rate of this, volume of that, what do you think, 300 PSI, 250 PSI. 
they don't do that. In each hospital, in each, in each, in each room, cath lab, CT lab, or whatever, they'll have five, six shots that they do when they're doing angiographic procedures. So those protocols will be saved in memory. So they don't typically manually enter those things. They'll go into memory. They'll recall that protocol from memory, pull that up, and then it automatically pops up, and then they'll shoot from there. Okay. Does everybody have what well, I'm thinking of it? Everybody sign this? Anybody not sign this? All right. If you haven't, it'll be up here at the end of class. Um, now, I talked about the syringes. The syringes, like I said, are one-time use only. And another thing about the syringes, they are, with just a couple exceptions, they are model specific, all right? These are Stellant syringes. These syringes right here only fit on this model. You cannot put these on other models. And that's pretty much true of every single model. There's only a couple exceptions. And those exceptions typically are when like a new model comes out and replaces the older model. They don't redesign the syringe. They'll use the same old syringe. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes they do just say, nope, we're scrapping everything. But like the Mark V Plus and the Provis, those are the two, more two of the more common uh, angio injectors. The Provis is the newer. When they came up with the Provis, they just kept the same old syringes. So the Mark V Plus and the Provis have the same exact syringe. But like I said, for the most part, syringes are model specific. Uh, some hold two syringes, one contrast, one flush saline, and they are single use and disposable, like I said. Now this particular model, um, one thing I haven't brought up, um, angio injectors, the ones that shoot really, really fast shots used in your typical x-ray room, um, they just have contrast syringes. They never use saline. And it's just, just due to the nature of the beast. It's what they're used for. Angio injectors don't have a dual head. None of them have dual head syringes. None of them have a contrast and a saline syringe. CT injectors, most, and when I say most, I mean like 98%, might be 99% of CT injectors are dual head injectors. There is a contrast syringe and a saline syringe. About the only place you'll find a single head injector, which means it just has a contrast syringe, no saline. But the only place you'll find that is in a hospital that has like a four slice CT system. Do those still exist? Anybody have one? Yeah, I mean, they're rare or a vet clinic. You might see in a vet clinic, like I have a dog that had to have a CT and they use contrast and it was just, it was a single head version. But in a normal hospital, if you have a 16 slice or better CT injector, there's no point. You're wasting the capabilities of that CT, CT system if you're just using a single head injector. So the vast majority of CT injectors are dual head, although single head is an option. For MI and MRI injectors, they are all dual syringes. They're, every single MRI injector on the planet has a contrast syringe and a saline syringe with it. And again, it's just what they're used for. There's never a time when they would shoot just contrast into a patient for MRI. Um, this is the thing I was, I brought this up earlier, the three parameters that the operator has to select, flow rate, volume, and pressure limit. Um, some injectors, and I just mentioned this, are capable of injecting both contrast and saline. The injection of H-fluid must be programmed separately. It's considered a separate phase, and that's what I was talking about earlier. Each time we wish to change the flow rate of a fluid, you need to program a new phase. So <clears throat> there are times when I don't actually like phase one and phase two, I don't just necessarily change fluids. I might want to start my injection off with a very fast injection. And then once the, that body part is full of that fluid, I'll back the flow rate off. So um, phase one and phase two might both be contrast. It's just the first phase is going to be a, a faster flow rate. And then I switch to the second phase and continue with the rest of it with just a slower injection or a slower flow rate. Now hold and pause. Um, these sound like the same thing, but they are technically different. Now, how we would do this, if I select, uh, let's, let's make uh, uh, phase one here, I'm gonna leave this one, uh, let's leave it, make it five, make it this 20, uh, let's crank this up, let's go to 10. Um, then it's made, we'll make phase two. Um, when I select the button on this particular display over here, you select the, the arrows over here to, to select that phase. I can select, uh, let's, let's do a hold. And then phase three, I will go to, I, will, I have my choice of contrast or saline. So I'll select saline. And again, I'll make that 10 and let's make it 30. Enter. So this one, I actually have a three phase injection. All right, phase one is contrast, phase two is a hold, phase three is saline. Now a hold is a permanent stoppage of the injection. All right, if for whatever reason, there's many reasons and they do this all the time. Um, when the first phase is done, 
I want the injector to, I'm gonna lock the protocol. I'm gonna arm the injector. Do you wish to confirm you have checked for air? Yes. So we're gonna do this shot now. Start, we're shooting contrast. Contrast injection's over. Now we're on a hold, all right? The doctors, nurses, techs, they do whatever they have to do. Now this hold will last indefinitely until the operator hits the start button again. And then it will move on to the next phase or phases and finish up, all right? So that's a hold. Now a pause, a hold is a permanent stoppage of the injection until the operator intervenes and starts it back up again. Gotta wait for it to do its thing. A hold, or I'm sorry, a pause, sort of the same thing as a hold, but it's for a specific amount of time and it's in seconds. So in this case, I'm going to lock the protocol, arm the injector, Yes, I've checked for air. Now this one, I'm gonna hit the start switch. We'll do phase one. There's a five second pause without the operator doing anything. Ooh, almost had it timed perfectly. It goes on to the next phase. That is the subtle but important difference between a hold and a pause. A pause is just a temporary stop and then without the operator having to do anything, it will move on to the next phase. Whereas a hold, it doesn't move on to the next phase until the operator tells it to. Pauses. Pauses are pretty rare. Uh, it's, it, they usually uh, program holds instead of pauses. Uh, program delays. There's two kinds of delays, uh, but there's three different names for them. It'll make sense here in a second. Um, now, something I haven't brought up, I, mean, I, I briefly mentioned it earlier, but uh, the imaging system, the CT, Angio, MRI system, and the contrast injector some in some cases can actually electronically be connected to each other they can be interfaced and that's referred to as isi and that, that that's universal that term isi imaging system interface that's when we actually take a cable and we're going to connect it from the contrast injector to the imaging system whether it's the ct angio or mri well not mri ct or angio systems mris don't do this um but basically what that does is now i've the two systems are talking to each other now you have to remember, if they're not talking to each other, I have an x-ray system that has to be started with an exposure switch, and then I have a CT or I have an injector system that has to be started with the inject switch, all right? And this is 50-50. It's not like 90% of the time they do it this way. It's, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's interfaced, sometimes it's not. If we're not interfaced, the operators have two buttons they have to hit. They have an exposure switch and an inject switch they have to hit to make the image be produced. If they're interfaced, what that does is, that means I only have one button I need to hit. And it can be either the start switch or the exposure switch. You hit this, you hit either one button and it, it fires both of them, okay? Now, that makes it very convenient for the operators. Now, sometimes, a lot of the time, I don't want both to start at the same time. Sometimes I want the imaging system to go and then so many seconds later, we'll start injecting the fluid into the patient and vice versa. Sometimes I want to get this patient primed with contrast before I start the imaging process on them, all right? So sometimes I want one to start before the other. So we have to delay one of them. Now, uh, the first kind I'm gonna bring up is some called inject delay. That's exactly what it sounds like. We're gonna delay the start of the injector, okay? So the imaging system will start, and then so many seconds later, the injector starts, all right? Now that can be programmed into the imaging system. Or I'm sorry, into the, the injector display, all right? So they will select a three second inject delay, all right? So what that does is if they're interfaced, that means I can hit either the exposure switch or the injector start switch and the imaging system starts and without any extra effort, three seconds later, the injector starts injecting, okay? Without the operator having to worry about it, all right? If they're not interfaced, let's say they're not connected to either, I, that delay is still useful to the operator because now let's say, um, I don't, let's say I want a three second delay, but I don't program a three second delay. That means the operator has to hit the exposure switch, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, hit the start switch, which they do sometimes. But if I program a three second delay without them interfaced, that still helps me because now I can hit both buttons at the same time, the exposure switch and the start switch, and the injector start or the image system starts shooting and then the injector starts its countdown. So I still get my easy three second delay without the operator having to figure it out. All right, so whether you, it's, whether the ISI is connected or not, they'll still program delays, okay? 
So that's Injectolay. That's the same CT angio MRI injectors that's always called Injectolay. Now the other kind of delay is where my injector is going to start injecting, but the imaging system is going to kick in so many seconds later. Now that goes by two names. Now the first one uh, is uh, is called X-ray delay. Now that's for angio injectors because angio injectors use X-rays to produce the images. So that's X-ray delay. Same exact process, same exact thought. It's just instead of programming, and it's done here. Uh, instead of programming an X-ray delay, I'm sorry, instead of programming an inject delay, I'll program an X-ray delay. The injector starts, and then the X-ray system kicks in, all right? For the other two kinds of contrast injectors, CT and MRI injectors, a CT injector is hooked up to a CT scanner. An MRI injector is hooked up to an MR scanner. So for those two kinds of models, it's typically, it's not called X-ray delay, it's called scan delay. It's the same exact thing, it's just a second name. All right, so there's X-ray delay and scan delay for the imaging systems. Then there's in the inject delay for the injectors. We got it? Any questions? All right. Uh, this, oh man, I thought I was further along. <laughs> All right, uh, KVO. Some injector models have this, uh, some, some don't. Um, KVO is, uh, stands for keep vein open. Uh, this is, uh, this is, angio injectors don't do this, CT and MRI injectors do. Uh, CT and MRI injectors, remember, use an IV needle. You place an IV needle in the patient's arm. If you don't shoot a shot through that IV needle for an extended period of time, a blood clot can form, uh, uh, start forming at the tip of that IV needle. So to keep that from happening, they'll program a KVO, keep, keep vein open. What that does is, and it, uh, it, it's going to either shoot a very slow trickle of fluid and it's typically the saline syringe, very slow trickle of fluid through the end of that IV needle just to keep the vein open. Uh, and some models don't do a constant trickle like 0.1 milliliter per second flow. Sometimes they'll do just a 0.25 milliliter shot every 20, 30 seconds or something like that. Same exact effect, but that's KVO. Again, CT and, AM, CT and MRI injectors do it. Angio injectors don't bother with that. Um, a test injection is an injection, we're gonna make sure, again, this is uh, CT and MRI only, angio injectors, they don't bother with it because they use catheters, but because CT and MRI use IV needles, um, we're gonna make sure that we actually got the needle in the vein, all right? So, before we go firing 150 milliliters of fluid into the patient and then realize, oh man, we're not even in the vein here, we'll do what's called a test injection. And that's gonna be a very low flow rate, so it's gonna be one milliliter per second, to be very low volume, like three or five milliliters. And they'll, the operator will do a test injection. That will be the first phase. Let's do this. Let's uh, make this contrast. Um, and then I'll go. Now, if you're going to do a test injection, can you do a test injection on phase two or phase three? Phase four? No, that would be silly. All right, we've already fired fluid in the patient. Now, hey, let's check that needle. No, it's going to be phase one. So phase one, you'll notice, um, first option up here, and it's blue, saline fluid, test inject. All right, if I try that with, cancel. If I try that with phase two or further, notice that test inject button is not there. So phase one, I'll hit test inject, and it is, uh, I did that, it's not normally 20. Um, it's uh, gonna be a pre-programmed flow rate and volume. It's done in the setup menu. Uh, so the test injection is always gonna be phase one. And then you see that line that goes underneath that phase, that's a hold, okay? So the, we'll do the test injection. As soon as the test injection is finished, the, the injector goes in a hold state and then the operator leaves the room because they'll do this test injection by the patient because they need to watch the patient's arm. They'll leave the room, go into the control room and from the display, finish the rest of the shot. So that's a test injection. Um, I think I already talked about, well, I talked about the enable button. If, uh, well, maybe I didn't, no, I didn't. Um, the enable button, these are the forward and reverse load buttons right here, the, meet, the manual knobs down here, which are down here. This is how we can manually move the pistons forward and reverse, um, but you'll notice, I mean, I can use the manual knob whenever I want, all right? But the electronic forward and reverse buttons, and this is pretty much universally true, um, to manually move the pistons forward and reverse, notice they don't, they don't move anything. That's because we don't want 
to be connected to the patient, and then the operator grabbed the injector head and accidentally moved the piston forward or reverse while we're connected to the patient. So before these buttons work, we have to hit the enable button. Now, when you hit the enable button, it's enabled for about five seconds. If you don't do anything, then it just disables itself. Maybe it's 10 seconds. All right, so it's out, no movement. Now, when I hit the enable button, now the forward and reverse buttons work. And they're variable speeds, you can go very slow to relatively very fast. Same thing in reverse. Okay, so that's the enable button, very important. Uh, the armed indicator lights, those were the lights that lit up down here when I armed it, I showed you guys earlier. Nope. And that is it. I don't have a big flourish ending. Anybody have any questions? Yes. What's the what? Oh no, no. Um, there's, there's, there's. Um, uh, the PM kits primarily consist of gaskets, and so there's gaskets around the top here. There's gaskets along the side and the bottom that that do help prevent. It's like it's like you know the watches that they say they're water waterproof, water resistant. Waterproof means no water gets in. Water resistant means it's yeah, water will get in there. You know it will. Um, these are fluid resistant gaskets. Contrast uh, does sometimes get inside the injector head. So that's why the maintenance on these things is important. It's very important to keep the gaskets um, uh, up to up, keep them fresh and not let them let them get dry rot and things like that because. It's part of the, the annual PM. Yep. Now, maintenance on these things. Um, whenever, whenever we're doing the training in class, I, I do tell the students uh, that this is going to be the easiest week of training you've ever attended in your life for for three reasons. One, um, these are simple machines. Contrast injectors. This is it's just a pump. It's a high end pump, but at the end of the day, it is just a pump. It's a piston pump. I mean, it's you can dress it up and connect it to imaging systems all you want, but in the in the, the arsenal of uh, all the weapons that we have to keep patients healthy and fix them. This is figuratively and literally a squirt gun. It is very, very simple, all right? Another reason why the training on these is so simple is these are kind of like infusion pumps and defibrillators in the sense you've seen one, you've seen them all. They all do the same thing, 90%. Now every, every model will have its own little bell or whistle or feature that's kind of unique to it. But for the most part, especially somebody who's been trained on three or four models, they can walk up to any contrast injector on the planet. They'll know how to operate it. They'll know how to do the rudimentary PM procedures. The, uh, for the most models, the, the, test, the test equipment is the same. The test procedures are pretty much the same. So um, there's that. And then the third reason is there is something that we've developed when I say, no. Um, there's something we've developed and it's a, it's a software program that takes you through the PM procedure and it's called MIST, um, Mall Injector Service Tool. And it's a software program that's a very video heavy software program that literally takes you step by step by step by step through the entire PM procedure. You start the program and it literally has you turn the machine on and it shows you where to get all this, the software, or the, all the uh, um, uh, uh, serial numbers and model numbers and software versions of anything. Then you move into the maintenance and there's a video of how to clean this. There's a video of how to take this apart. There's a video of how to get this board and tweak this potentiometer if you need to do that. Uh, there's a video that shows you how to do the pressure checks, the timer checks, and everything. And then at the very end of the PM procedure, the software produces, as, you, as you're going through the P, PM procedure, you're, you're documenting your results and you're documenting information in the software. And at the end of the procedure, uh, it produces, when you hit, you know, I'm done, it produces a, a PM report. It's a two-page PDF document that lists every single procedure you went through, all the information you entered in the program. So then it, it, it automatically saves that to your laptop. So that's... That's just my little advertisement for the training we provide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do touch screens or calibration? The older ones do that, yes. Um, the uh, the newer ones, I have not gotten any calls because this is, like I said, there's there's new Certegra monitors, which looks like a flat screen. And then there's, this is actually even newer than that. Um, the manufacturers used to put buttons on the backs of the displays, on, on the legacy displays that you could you press both buttons at the same time it'll put you into the touchscreen calibration procedure and you would do it that way um for the newer models and i guess it's because it's a flat screen monitor versus that old legacy monitor it was touchscreen but it wasn't like a, a, a modern day flat screen um yeah they don't they don't have that procedure for the newer for the newer screens anymore 
I assume it's because they deemed them not necessary because they've been out for about five or six years and I have never gotten a call on one of those screens needing a, a, a touchscreen calibration and there's, there is no procedure for it. So I'm assuming their new screens don't require that anymore. Yeah. What is one of the most common discrepancies that you have with one of these machines? That's really uh, model specific, but just since I have this one right here, the Stellant, um, uh, the most common things that go wrong with this one, the injector head or the injector cable right here. One of the things, one of the things I didn't bring up during class is every time we fill the syringe, you have to use, this is, this is a fill tube right here. Okay. Notice it's relatively short, very thick tube. And so they put the fill tube on the syringe like that. And then they'll take their bottle of contrast or saline and then put the tube in it. And then they'll use the buttons here to retract the piston to fill the syringe up. Um, Every time we fill the syringe, obviously we want to have the injector head pointing up because that way any air bubbles that get in the syringe during, during the fill procedures, we want them to fall to rise to the top. So when we prime the tubing, once so after we, we filled it, we connect the connector tubing. Now we have to prime all the tubing to get all the air out. Um, so we want the air bubbles at the top of the syringe. So every time we fill, the injector head is up. Now, just in case we miss an air bubble or two, every time we inject, we tilt the injector head down. Okay. Now some models, this is not one of them. Some models can actually tell the tilt position of the injector head. It can tell where it's at. And if the injector head is pointing up or if it's above horizontal and you go to arm the injector, it won't allow you to. A little message will pop up saying tilt the injector head down. Again, this doesn't have that feature, but every time we inject, we point the head down. So every time we fill, heads up. Every time we shoot, heads down. So this head cable coming out of the injector head here, uh, over the years, there's just a lot of flexing of that cable you know what happens to a wire when you flex it over and over and over again? Um, somewhere up here, one of these wires go bad. And there's not an, a, a, a head cable error code because there's literally 50 wires inside here. Which, whichever wire pops off uh, will kind of determine what kind of error, error message you're getting. Okay. Um, so there's that one. Uh, on my display down here for the Stellan, there's a, an error code 3026, 3028. That's your 48 volt power supply that commonly goes bad. And then the third most common issue on this one is the display board here. And it's just because it gets pressed, it gets contrast on it. So the display board going bad, and it's an easy one to see. There's not really an error code other than I'm hitting the buttons and nothing's happening. Or the displays just go blank. Then you just have to replace the display board. For the, uh, the, the uh, Spectra Solaris has its own most common issues. The Provis has, definitely has its own most common issues. So there's not like, if there were one that was kind of universal, the head cable that I just described. Not every injector, <laughs> has a head cable like this, but most of them do, and it, that's common amongst pretty much all of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But that's, again, that's strictly for the, this one down here. Um, but yeah, there is a sensor that the system can sense when a syringe is in the well and when there's not. And the sensor down in there, if it, it gets any contrast or saline on it, uh, it's, a, it's, an LE, it's, a, it's an optical detector. So if any contrast or saline gets on the LED or on the optical detector, Obviously, the light won't pass through the optical detector, so the system won't sense that a syringe has been placed in the wall. That's a common one for the Stellan as well. No, no, not a position sensor. It's it's a little window down here that just can tell if the syringe is in it or out. But this button right here, I mean, uh, if you can't see it, you notice the tip of my piston here retracts. That's a position sensor. The, the system knows where the, the piston is because of this retractable tip. Because of this retractable tip on my piston here, as soon as you install the syringe, the piston will come up and dock with it. You'll see it here. As soon as I install it, the system comes up. So the system knows when, to, when the piston has made contact with the plunger based on that retractable tip there. So that's, that's the, actually the position sensor. Again, most injectors don't have that. That's kind of a unique. Remember I said the Stellan's, the Cadillac of contrast injectors? That's, it, it has all these little bells and whistles and features that are good for demonstration purposes. Anything else? Anybody have any other questions? All right, make sure if everybody, some of you guys in the back, if you didn't get a book, I think there's some uh, extra manuals sitting up here. Uh, stop by my booth. Um, I think I have extra manuals at the booth, uh, folders, my nice pens. All right, thank you very much, you guys.